Stein, founder of CoCalc, and in this demo, I'm going to explain how to use the Scratch directory on a compute server. Okay, I'm in a CoCalc project, and I'm going to create a brand new compute server, but everything I'm saying could also be applied to an existing compute server that you already have. So I click on the Servers tab. Um, I already have lots of compute servers, over 100 but let's make a brand new one just for this demo. So I'll call this demo of scratch. And uh, in terms of what I'll configure, I'll just take the defaults. It won't matter very much, but everything I'm gonna say makes perfect sense for any compute server you create on-prem uh, or rather self-hosted HyperStack or Google Cloud. So the key thing to look into is the um, section in settings labeled fast local directories. Basically, as explained in the help, these are directories that are available directly on the compute server. They're not mounted over the network. The home directory on a compute server is mounted over the network from cocalc.com. So it can be uh, slower and the disk space is very limited. The nice thing about the scratch directory is you can make the disk really, really large. Um, it, the, these scratch directories, these fast local directories, use the persistent disk that's local to the compute server. So I'll just make this, uh, for reference, 100 gigabytes. And I'll use a faster disk, so it's really fast and local. And um, by default, when you make a new compute server, it'll have one directory called scratch. And you can make any other ones you want as well. So I'll make another one called um, demo. So these two subdirectories of my home directory on the compute server are going to be stored locally only on the compute server. They'll not be backed up to CoCalc, they'll not be copied over, they won't be synchronized in any way, but they'll be very fast and are appropriate as sort of a local staging place where I can put data or software I want to compile or whatever um, that I don't care about too much long term and that I might read and write frequently. Okay, so let's start this new compute server running and it's starting up. Um, again, this should take about one to two minutes on uh, Google Cloud and on HyperStack it can take a little bit longer depending on the image size. And for fun, you can always click on this little tiny terminal indicator um, on Google Cloud at least and you can watch the um, console as the compute server boots up. So you can see all the log output. Once it boots up, what we're going to do is make a terminal that's running on the compute server. And in the terminal, we're going to inspect the home directory. We'll write some files in the main home directory, and then we'll also write some files in the scratch directory. And we'll see that when we write files in the main home directory, those are synchronized back and forth to the home base to cocalc.com's like sort of central backed up snapshotted uh, shared storage. Whereas when we make files in the scratch directory, those are going to exist only on the compute server. So we're waiting. Um, we have to wait until these bars get all the way to 100%. And that indicates that the compute server has both booted up and started all of its uh, um, software running. And we're almost there. And it's done. Okay, so let's go to our uh, terminal. To make a new terminal, by the way, you click New and then click Linux Terminal. So I'll name this Demo Terminal and then click Linux Terminal. Now we have a new terminal. This terminal is running in the home base by default, but we want it to run on the demo server. So I'm going to click Demo Server and then that will move the terminal to run on our demo server. Okay, and here we are, host name. This is the demo server. Tap top and see that the compute resources are a little different. Um, and here we are. And if we type ls, notice that uh, we have a directory scratch and a directory demo. These are my local scratch directories that exist only on the compute server. So to illustrate this, I will go into the scratch directory I'm just going to create a little file, echo foo to bar.txt. And then if I type ls, there's our file. If you'd like to do all of this through a more graphical 
approach, you can click on the Explorer and switch that so it runs on the compute server. And then this is showing you exactly files on the compute server. And we can see here's the scratch directory and here's this file bar.txt. You can click on it and edit it there. And then we can also save the file, go back to the terminal and type cat bar.txt and there's our file. Okay, so this is all um, files that are in a scratch directory on the compute server. Now, if we make another terminal that's not running on the compute server, so switch back to the home base, uh, notice that the scratch directory just isn't here at all. And if we look at this and type ls here, uh, we'll see that the uh, scratch directory is also not available here. And finally, if you, it really wouldn't be. Um, we have to click sync uh, periodically to synchronize the files between the compute server and the home base. But even then, the files are still not going to be synced over, as you can see. So now let's make a file that's in our home directory. So uh, I'll call this, I'll just say echo blah to in home directory txt. This is not in the local fast scratch directory. And you can see that the file's there. If I do cat, you can see that it's there. If I use the file manager, I'll see that it's right here. Um, but when I go to the compute server, uh, initially the file might not be there, but it will be there within a second or, or within 30 seconds or after you click the sync button. So notice that this file, which is at the top level um, of the home directory is synchronized back and forth between the compute server and the main home base project. And so we can open this file here. We can write something into it, click save. It automatically gets synced back to the home base. If I go over here, that additional stuff I just typed should be reflected. And it is, see it's at the bottom. So basically there's two situations with your files. One is that you have files that are uh, synchronized back and forth, and the other is you have files that exist only on the compute server. So the nice thing about the files that are only on the compute server is that you can uh, put a large number of files here and work with them in a very efficient manner. So just as an example, let's get clone the SageMath source code. So sagemath.org, um, download, clone from GitHub. And I like Sage because I started this project long ago. So I'll get the code. And this is a pretty big Git repository with a large number of files. And it's, uh, it can be painful to work with the, say, entire Sage source code and, for example, to build Sage from source if you're doing that over the, a networked file system. So it's really something where it's much better if you have it running uh, locally in a scratch directory. So just to summarize while this is running, my compute server is configured in settings so that I have two fast local directories, scratch and demo. Files that I put in scratch and demo, like I'm doing right now with this Git repository, are only written to the compute server. They don't get copied automatically back to the main project, to the main home base. This is Good and bad. It's bad because it's not backed up, but it's good because it's fast and it puts no, um, there's no resource usage in terms of the network or the file system on the home base. Okay, so let's let this finish. It takes a little while to uh, do everything, but in a moment we'll have the complete Sage source code and then we can poke at it for a second and we'll just see that it's very fast to poke around with. So uh, it's 596 megabytes. If you want to do something like tar up all the source code, this should be extremely fast um, because it's all just reading and writing it locally. So that tarred up, it created a brand new 600 almost megabyte file or 567 megabyte file that has the complete Sage um, source code right here. And this is only using this, it's using little bits of my 100 gigabytes of disk space that I created when I created this compute server. And if I want to go in here and do something like find dot word cache or git log, like all these commands 
that involve reading potentially the entire directory tree or lots of data, uh, this is extremely fast, as you can see. If I was doing the same thing over the network, it might not be nearly as fast. Although we do have a lot of caching and stuff to make that fast as well. Okay, and then the key thing, finally, just to note for the, uh, to be redundant, um, if I click sync, it's not going to synchronize these fast local scratch directories. So if I look at my normal project right here, um, notice that I don't see any trace of the files that are only on the compute server. I do see them if I browse around using the graphical interface and I've explicitly selected that I'm on the compute server. Uh, so see that this, all this stuff is here, but if you switch this browser back to the home base, then you don't see any of that stuff. And if you're wondering what's up with this cloud directory, that's a third type of storage that's different from Scratch and different from the home directory from the home base that's mounted over the network. Cloud is a uh, um, third type. Let's see if it's even mounted at all. So on the compute server, I'm going to type df, Let's see what appears. And notice that there's a directory here called cloud. And this is a so-called one petabyte file system. So it's um, ridiculously large and it's only, only 76 megabytes are being used right now. So this directory called cloud, this is not available in the home base. It's uh, a network mounted file system that is backed by Google Cloud Storage. It allows you to store an essentially unlimited amount of data and it's reasonably fast to read and write to, but not nearly as fast as a local scratch directory. But um, it's still extremely useful. The best application for this is, say you have a, a lot of data, something large that you wanna store long-term. For example, I could copy that tarball I made of the Sage um, source code and drop it here. So let's see how long that takes. So it's copying this 567 megabyte tarball over to the cloud file system. And then what happens behind the scenes is it's going to take that uh, tarball, it chunks it up into a bunch of um, smaller blobs, like these uh, little blobs, and then it stores those in Google Cloud Storage uh, long term, but it makes it appear as a single nice clean file system. So that's what we have here. We'll do like a little test to make sure the file makes sense. Yep. Um, and notice the disk usage is bigger now. And let's see, there's a little, I want to check on the status of the file system. Yeah, so that tells you that it's uh, not writing anything, so it's all done. And that's it. Okay, there's a lot of other things to be done. Okay, so I hope you found this video useful. And, uh, oh, let me show you one, well, let me just make one note. I'm gonna delete this compute server. And when I do this, the uh, copy of Sage that I cloned, everything I put in those scratch directories, well, if I turn it off, they still persist. They're still there. So they're sitting on that disk. There's no way to access that data though, except by turning the compute server back on. But you can turn it off and then the price goes down from, uh, I think it was like two cents per hour to like a lot less. So this becomes extremely cheap, but the only way to access your data is to turn the compute server back on. And if you further deprovision this compute server, which I'll do in a moment, then the um, local scratch disk, of course, just gets completely wiped. So let's uh, go, let's deprovision this. And now the data is really completely gone. Uh, except for what was on the cloud file system, that's a different story. So that Sage tarball that I made and stuck on the cloud file system, that's saved long term. And that would be available if I were to start this up again. Um, actually, just for fun, I'll do that. You can turn the video off if you're done, but if you want to wait a minute, this is starting up again after I completely deprovisioned it. All the scratch stuff I created, gone completely. But what I put in the cloud file system, once this boots up and everything mounts, that should still be there. Okay. Also, one other note, whenever you edit files on the compute server using the graphical interface, the time travel history of your edits, um, those, are all, those are stored no matter what, even if you're editing files in a scratch directory. 
So if you're working with a bunch of, say, Jupyter notebooks or Python files or whatever in a scratch directory, and somehow you manage to just accidentally delete it all or, or you make a big mistake, at least the time travel history is still available. So if you just um, recreate that directory, even if it's empty, and then try to open one of the files you had before, or look in the log to try to open one, you can use time travel and recover your work. Basically, any file you're editing through um, CoCalc's interface is getting backed up via time travel to our database, no matter where you're editing that file. So that can be useful to know about. Okay, so this is almost back. It can take a few seconds for the cloud file system to mount after the compute server starts up. So don't be surprised if, uh, yeah, so the cloud file system is not quite mounted yet. Uh, there's a separate Docker container that uh, will get started within about 30 seconds. Uh, yeah, called cloud file system. And now, yep, the cloud file system is now available. And let's see, there it is. And we can go in there and there's this file sage.tar. And we can do tar t uh, test Bobo's file sage.tar word count dash off. So I think this should uh, read the file and give the directory listing. As you can see. Um, but the point is the scratch directory is completely gone. Look in the contents. There's nothing there. See? Scratch is empty. However, as I mentioned, if you look in the log and try to open one of the files we had before, remember bar.txt, we edited it graphically, so time travel still knows about it. So we can, um, so the edits we made there are available. We can click revert um, and our file is back. So you can have, so editing stuff through CoCalx UI uh, gives you kind of a backup at least of things that you actually wrote with your own hands, which is nice. Okay, so thanks a lot for watching this video. I hope you give CoCalx unique uh, interface a try, and if you have any questions, contact us. Thanks, bye.